thanks for being with us. Um, today we are at the Friedrich Naumann Foundation conference, the future of money. And um, I would like to ask you some general question about first, what is money? Money. Well, money is, uh, according to economists, any generally accepted means of exchange. It's the th stuff people use to buy things with uh, on a regular basis. So, of course, the exact, um, the exact uh, concrete meaning of the term varies from place to place and time to time. In the uh, debate about uh, our future system of the uh, um, banking system, we hear about uh, terms like uh, fiat money. And could you just elaborate what is what it is about? Well, fiat money is a term used to refer to the paper money issued by government authorities in their central banks. And its its unique characteristic is that it isn't a claim to anything, it's not an IOU, it's not redeemable in some more basic form of money like gold or uh, silver. It's simply pieces of paper that owe their value to uh, the fact that they have been introduced into circulation. Usually at one point in the past they were claims to gold or silver. Then the right to convert them was removed and people found themselves holding pieces of paper that they continued to use as money even though they had no source of value other than the demand for money itself and that's fiat money. So um, are there certain particularities related with fiat money or are there special dangers involved by using it or having a system based on it? Oh yeah, fiat money is extremely dangerous stuff. As it costs hardly anything to produce, it can be multiplied, uh, uh, expanded, uh, almost without practical limit. Uh, a central bank today that issues fiat money could inflate uh, without encountering any material limits at all until the money that it issues became worth no more than the actual paper and ink it was printed on. Uh, this is in contrast to a commodity money like gold or silver, which is costly to reproduce and uh, which at some point is not cannot be profitably reproduced. And so the his history shows that with gold and silver monies and such, you have very strict limits to inflation. In fact, uh, the long-run tendency with gold was for the value of a unit of gold to remain fairly steady over centuries. Whereas with fiat money, the tendency, equally clear, is for the, the money to depreciate year after year after year, uh, and sometimes very rapidly. So uh, you mentioned gold um, as a guarantee backing the currency, um, the so-called gold standard. In how far would the gold standard be feasible to uh, introduce in our system, to replace our current system by a gold standard? Do you think it's realistic or how could one do it? Well, the problem with monetary standards is that uh, they, they are networks, a little bit like con computer software. And uh, what that means in practice is once you have an established standard, whether it's a commodity standard or a fiat standard, it's very costly to change to another standard. It's, you're switching networks, essentially, and the transition from one network to another can, can involve a lot of waste. And I don't think anyone knows how to do it very easily. Well, uh, we, we moved from gold to fiat money easily enough by taking promises that seemed valid and suddenly having de governments declare them no longer valid, and then people were stuck with these p pieces of paper. Uh, moving back to gold, unfortunately, isn't nearly as easy as moving away from it was. And the consequence of that is that even though a gold standard, once it's established, would have properties that would make it in many ways superior to a fiat standard, it's, uh, it's very difficult to engineer a transition. It can be done, but it generally wouldn't be worth it unless you had an extremely unstable system that was falling apart. Of course, for some countries, that is the, if, the reality. Russia would, would make plenty of sense for Zimbabwe, for example, to try to establish a gold standard. It has nothing to lose. The transition costs would be small compared to the costs of sticking with the existing arrangement. So, um, 
right now uh, the world, as we hear, is in a financial crisis. So governments around the globe are busy looking for solutions to overcome this crisis and at the same time also to find ways and measures and legislation to prevent a crisis uh, of similar kind in the future. So first, what should governments do at the moment to overcome this crisis? The first thing governments need to do is to allow bad banks to fail and other bad financial institutions. And the next thing they need to do, which is related to the first, is to allow good financial institutions to prosper and grow and to allow new institutions to enter the market. Unfortunately, uh, what governments are in fact doing is uh, propping up the very financial institutions that have invested badly and that have become insolvent. And when governments do that, although it appears that they're saving uh, banks, saving financial institutions, they are in fact also uh, uh, preventing sound institutions from growing. And this is a big mistake. We have the analogous problem in the U.S. with respect to the auto industry. It's more clear to people in this case that when the government gives loans and other support to failing automo automobile companies like Chrysler and GM, it is doing so ultimately at the expense of those auto manufacturers, many of which also operate in the United States, like Toyota and Nissan, that have been doing relatively well. So you're not encouraging or promoting health in the industry, you're actually doing the opposite. So the first thing the government needs to do is to, to uh, apply market discipline. Unfortunately, this is something it's not good at doing at all. The other thing the government needs to do is to uh, take steps to make it impossible for the central bank to promote a boom. Uh, the Federal Reserve promotes a boom about once every 10 years. Sometimes they're not so bad in their consequences, but often they're very bad as in the recent crisis. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to prevent central banks from misbehaving in this fashion, except ultimately to deprive them of discretionary powers of money creation. That's a radical reform, but it's one people need to take seriously. Josh, um, just one last question on this uh, on the current crisis. You answered it to some extent, and or you mentioned it in your reply, but uh, very often people just blatantly say, oh, this is a proof of market failure, that the capitalist system is not able to cope. And what do you think about that? Well, I think the same thing about such arguments as, as made uh, in present times as I do about them as they were made back during the Great Depression in the 30s. They're simply ignorant arguments. People need to understand that financial systems today are very heavily regulated throughout the world. And in U.S. history, the banking system has always been subject to very extreme regulations. Somehow people simply tend to assume that banks are not regulated, uh, or at least that they're not regulated enough. If they were to take the matter seriously, to study it seriously, they would discover not only that banks have been subject to all kinds of regulations, but also that some of these very regulations have contributed in important ways to the, the outbreak of the current crisis. And it's easy to come up with a long list of ways in which regulatory interference made the present crisis possible, not by itself, to be sure, but in conjunction with the mismanagement of the money supply by the central bank. Between those things, we have all the ingredients necessary for the present crisis, and in fact, it's rather hard to tell how a story of how we could have had this crisis without emphasizing those factors. George, thank you very much for your time, and uh, yeah, thanks for being with us. You're very welcome. Thank you.